Genshin Impact has created a vibrant world to explore, but with all its intricate mechanics, things can be a little daunting to new players, at least at first. The game has been out for a little over a month, and I now feel ready to help you guys with some of the mechanics that you might encounter in the first few hours of playing. As a heads up, this video is not aimed at the AR30 guys, but instead for those who are just getting started, or maybe even those who haven't even installed the game yet. I have another 15 tip guide on the way, so if you don't find any of these hints useful, be sure to check that video out afterwards. My name is Mr Wolfie, and as always, I aim to provide this info as quickly as possible, so without further ado, let's get started. When landing on the beach, you'll find that the combat of Genshin is as straightforward as it gets. Every character has an attack, a charged attack, an ability, and an ultimate. We don't need to deliberate on this for too long, but it's worth pointing out that most characters can charge their ability by holding down the button. The same can be said for the finisher ability as well. Lastly, every character comes with a slam move that they can perform by attacking in mid-air. For tip number two, I recommend that in the beginning you follow the story. This comes down to personal preference and player style, but I recommend following the main story for the first hour of gameplay. This will give you new characters, abilities, and a bunch of free stuff like weapons, artifacts, and gems. Although you won't be punished for wandering off, a lot of the puzzles that you may run into will require elemental interaction that your main character will simply not have. In addition, the game does a fairly decent job of explaining the new systems as you play, so if you're confused about something at first, just play on and it'll become clear soon enough. You'll have plenty of time to explore in no time at all, and the initial XP and power-ups that you will receive from the game's opening sequence is going to be very welcome. Next up, it's a good idea to get in the habit of swapping between your characters in order to utilise their elemental synergy. It may be tempting to play as just your main character in the early stages, however the sooner you become accustomed to your new characters, the better. In in order to get the most damage out of your team, learning a couple of basic elemental combos goes a long way. For example, fire and electric energy leads to good burst, whereas water and ice gives you good crowd control and other CC options. Luckily, the wind of your main character will synergise with pretty much everyone in your party, so don't hesitate to throw that in there every now and then. Although you will learn to master these later for ass clapping combos of pure spankage, it's a good idea to learn one or two simple combos in the beginning and begin to play around these. For my next point, let's talk about stamina a little bit. Stamina is the little yellow bar that is used for anything movement in the game. Whether you are running, climbing, gliding or swimming, stamina is used. The same stamina bar is shared across all characters and can be upgraded at the statues of the seven found around the map. More on this later. When sprinting, tapping the button is always better than holding it. This will get you further. Similarly, climbing without jumping is slower but will allow you to ascend higher. If you run out of stamina in the water, you drown. If you run out of stamina whilst climbing, you fall and it's worth noting that you do take fall damage in this game. Stamina also has some synergies with certain character abilities that you'll discover later, but for now, you won't have to worry about this too much. When out and about, you may come across small greenish-blue wisps called Seelies. You don't necessarily collect these, but following them will lead you to treasure. These are in a fixed location in every game, meaning that you can look up a map on where to find them if you are so desperate to do so. For now though, just know that following these spirits will eventually lead you to some loot that is probably hidden somewhere close by. Further along your exploratory journey, you are going to come across a sea of mini puzzles. This can be as simple as a chest covered in thorns or nodes of power that need to be activated with a corresponding element. These are all pretty much self-explanatory over time, but are perhaps not as clear initially in the beginning. Sometimes you'll have to defeat a cluster of enemies, sometimes you'll have to activate a wind current, sometimes you'll have to light the beacons a Gondor. Using your elemental sight, which is middle mouse on PC, L1 and right on the D-pad on console, will sometimes reveal hidden areas which can also conceal chests. Just be sure to slam these mofos before you leave and grab your freebies on the way out. With this in mind then, navigating early on can be tough as the map will show large obscure sections with nothing in them. In order to fix this, just head for the closest statue of the Seven, indicated by the small circular icon within the map menu. These are your sort of Assassin's Creed map reveals that will allow you to better navigate the surrounding terrain. Grab these as early as possible in order to begin your network of teleport fast travel points and zip around the map much quicker. Activating the statues take little to no effort, with the exception of a few small Small skirmishes here and there, and will also provide you with a modest boost to your adventure rank, so there's really no drawbacks to prioritising these early on. If you try to get into certain parts of the map but are met with a preventative force field, this just means that you're not far enough in the story. Get past this by levelling up your adventure rank and performing the mainline missions as they unlock. In synergy with the World Tree, it is also worth mentioning Animoculus, which are similar to the Seelies mentioned earlier, only these are completely stationary, and can be collected directly into your inventory. These little blue homies are dotted around the map and should be given to any statue of the Seven as soon as possible. This will give you a bunch of rewards, including gems, AR experience, but also increase the total amount of stamina that you have in your stamina bar. Don't hesitate to deliver these, because the Animoculus exist solely for this purpose. Just dump them in and get stronger. Geoculus are found in a later part of the game and perform an identical function, only these little guys are orange. I wouldn't worry about these too much just now because these will go exclusively into the new statues when you enter the second region. 
Okay, let's talk about the different types of leveling up that happens inside Genshin. In the beginning, it's easy to get confused when people are talking about their level. There are three types of XP bars inside of the game and these relate to their own unlocks. First off is your character level. This is increased by using the hundreds of XP items that you collect over the course of your adventure and will simply add to your character's stats, i.e. their health, their attack and their defence. In the early stages for you guys, the character max rank will be 20, although you'll learn to increase this later. The second type of level is your adventure rank. This is the big green bar that will hover at the top of your screen and allows you to progress through Genshin's content system. Adventure rank will not make you stronger, however it will open future story content for you as you level. It's worth mentioning that your adventure rank will also grant you a bunch of free rewards as you increase it as well, so keep an eye on these at the Adventurer's Guild in Mondstadt. You can increase your adventure rank by opening chests, activating waypoints, completing quests and doing your chapter investigation rewards. Lastly, your world rank will also increase over time. World rank will increase the strength level of all the enemies you will encounter, but your world rank will also increase the quality and rarity of the items that you find in chests. It's a double-edged sword, but it's normally not a bad process. Sometimes your world rank will increase automatically, as your AR rank increases, and sometimes it will be halted by an ascension quest that you can choose to do when you're ready. Tip number 8 is to collect everything. As a gacha game, Genshin has a ton of items and loot for you to find and collect. In addition, there are also tons of food, flowers and minerals to pick up on your travels in the wild. Don't worry your little waifu ass though. Genshin gives you a generous backpack of 30,000 spaces, which means you can hoard everything to your heart's content. If your bag ever does become close to the bursting point, it's likely that you'll soon enough be smelting down your existing items into better ones. This in turn will give you even more room to breathe and you'll be right as rain, so grab everything. On the flip side, don't worry about missing chests either, either in domains or out in the world. Chests are pretty important in the long run of the game, but there are more than one or two lying around, so feel free to relax and don't oversearch. I'm kinda guilty of this by the way. Whilst that might be a good strategy for min-maxing, don't get too bogged down with your compulsive chest hunting tendencies. There's a lot of stuff to find and you're gonna have plenty of time to do it. Next on the cards we're going to talk about upgrading and refining your weapons. As you amass a huge inventory of gear, it might be tempting to start going ham salad with your upgrades and refining. You can honestly do this if you want, however it's probably a good idea to hoard your early weapons as fodder for making the good weapons even better later on. The early game content is not that difficult, and so beefing up the 2 and 3 star weapons is almost unnecessary. Again, you can do as you please, but I would suggest saving these resources as fuel for your 4 and 5 star weapons. In order to improve, you can select the weapons you want and hit upgrade. This can consumes the weaker weapons or crystals to charge and improve the new weapons and enhance its base damage stats. Refining is a separate process that you can undertake when you have a duplicate of the same weapon. Refining a sword for example will consume the duplicate and enhance the weapon's actual abilities. These can be seen before and after the refinement. In the beginning, if you're not sure what stats to aim for, generally leveling weapons with attack and attack percentage is a good place to start. On a similar note then, selecting and upgrading artifacts can be viewed in the same boat as weapons. Artifacts are essentially trinkets that you can add to your character and provide bonus stats. Artifacts are tiered from 1 to 5 stars, the higher the artifact, the more stats it will offer by default, and also hold a higher maximum ceiling for its upgrading process. Just like the weapons, you can upgrade these by fusing other artifacts into the new ones, however you cannot use crystals to power these. Artifacts will randomly start with a few bonus stats and gain extra ones up to a maximum of 4. They will gain these new stats every 4 levels. You can try to min-max your artifacts early on if that's your cup of tea, but even if you're not interested in having a full look just now, throw a few on for the extra stats and worry about customising them later on. A large part of the artifacts deal is lining up sets for the passive bonuses. For example, two artifacts of the Doctor set will give a bonus healing passive. Two artifacts of the Sojourner set will give an 18% bonus attack to that hero. There are artifacts that give a buff on their own, but for now just grab a few and mix any sets that make sense to you. If you're going to level any of these early on, I personally would recommend levelling the Feather first because it always gives a bonus attack, and this is never not useful. Alright, let's move on to Constellations and Talents. In a nutshell, Constellations are Genshin's failsafe system to protect players from getting duplicate characters. We'll discuss how to get new characters soon, but for now, Constellations will most likely remain untouched in the early game. For future reference, when you pull the same character 2, 3, 4 times over, the character will be consumed and power up your existing copy of that person. This means it's less painful to pull repeated duplicates and can actually begin to become beneficial. You can look along the Skyrim-esque lines and check out the future buffs and maybe even plan a new comp around the character that you weren't initially planning on using. Talents are simply an option for you to upgrade the combat abilities of your existing characters. Again, this will be locked in the early game and can be ignored for the time being. On the flip side, it's worth keeping an eye on this for when you begin ascending your characters later and can begin to make your favourite comps even stronger. I see a lot of players miss this initially, myself included, so don't be that guy and miss out on extra stat buffs. As you gain more adventure ranks, you may start to see a couple of big motherfucks starting to appear around the map. 
the earliest of these shouldn't be too much trouble for you, and may exist as barriers to certain objectives, like the Statue of the Seven. Most of the smaller bosses will provide artifacts and ascension craftables. Later on, Blossoms of Revelation, although more of an event, will provide you with character XP materials, whereas Blossoms of Wealth provide you with Mora, the game's currency. One thing to note is that collecting the rewards after these fights have finished will cost you resin, a resource that can be viewed on the map screen and slowly recharges over time. Because of this, it's normally efficient to do some of these bosses requiring resin at the start of your day so that you're constantly recharging the resource and min-maxing your resource collection. Lastly on this topic, new elite bosses and even weekly bosses will start to appear and you can tackle these for further ascension materials, artifacts and adventure XP, but you won't have to worry about these for now. When out in the world you may come across these luminous shrines. Each of these contain a luxurious chest, however they require a special key to open. You're not likely to have one of these keys in the early stages, but you will get them through quests and as a domain reward soon. These shrines are limited in number but do not show up on the world map. If you can't get in at the moment, it's generally a good rule of thumb to leave a marker on your current location so that you can find it easily again in the future. This way you can zoom back instantly and grab your free chest when ready. The domains require more effort and generally a higher level to get in. These are small challenge dungeons that offer crafting rewards upon completion. Some of the lower level domains may already be available to you, but don't worry if you can't get into others. If you come across an unlocked domain but don't want to enter it initially, it's still worth opening the door and then leaving immediately. This will turn the domain into a teleport point and give you some some primo gems for your trouble. You can then return there at a later date when you're good to go. Undoubtedly one of the most exciting parts of Genshin is rolling your packs to unlock new characters and weapons. In order for us to understand how this process works then, it's a good idea if we take a quick look at the wish system. Primo gems are the game's basic currency and will be used to buy a bunch of stuff from the in-game store. Primo gems are earned in a number of ways but mostly from quests, daily login rewards, commissions and even opening the in-game chests that you find in the world. As a new player, you especially want to be checking your mail as well as the game will donate a bunch of these to you for free at the start of the game. Two of the items that you can buy with Primo Gems are Acquainted Fates, the Blue Orbs and Intertwined Fates, the Pinky Purple Orbs, and these open the corresponding booster packs found on the Wish page. Each Wish costs a set amount of Primo Gems and has a chance to contain a 3, 4 or 5 star drop. At the time of this recording, every 10 packs you're guaranteed a 4 star drop and every 90 packs you're guaranteed a 5 star drop or a legendary item. In the beginning, it can be confusing to know which fates to buy with your gems, but you can peruse the details of each pack by clicking on the button at the bottom of each page. As a beginner, the game will offer you the new player bundle at a discounted price. You can only do this pack twice, and I would recommend doing it both times, as you receive 20 wishes for the price of 16. Lastly, you can also go into the store itself and have a look at any of the other drops that are purchasable with Primo Gems. In the Paimon's Bargain section, you can find some extra wishes at the cost of the Stardust or Star Glitter, which are the other examples of the game's free-to-play currency. It's up to you if you want to snap these up or save them for later, but I recommend grabbing a few more wishes from the Stardust section at least. Alright folks, to wrap this guide up we'll have a quick glance over some of the paid stuff as well that is available to players. For a more budget friendly approach, players can currently buy the Blessing of the Welkin Moon which will provide a small amount of Primo Gems up front and then drip feed further Primo Gems into the player's account every day for 30 days. If this isn't enough for you, you can also choose to purchase Genesis Crystals which can then be exchanged for in-game items, Primo Gems included. It's important to note that the first time you buy one of these bundles, you will be given double the number of crystals. Any consecutive purchases after this will not receive this bonus, so be careful and keep an eye out for this. Upon hitting Adventure Rank 20, players will also have the option of purchasing the in-game battle pass. This pass operates similarly to other battle passes that you might see in other games like PUBG. The paid for battle pass essentially enhances the free one that already exists in the game, except now you will receive extra rewards along the way. It is up to you as a player to decide whether this is worth it or not for you. And that about rounds out our list guys. Again, this video was for players who were perhaps feeling a little overwhelmed by Genshin in the beginning, or for those who are looking to pick the game up soon. As discussed earlier, I have another guide coming out with another 15 more advanced tips soon, so if you're still looking for some info, you can find that video linked here. Ratings on the video help out a ton, so feel free to shoot me a thumbs up below and let me know if there are any other tips that might help new players. As always, I have been Mr. Wolfie, much love, take care, and thank you for watching.